Hi, my name's Scotty, and I play hard games so you don't have to. And Dark Souls 1 has some of the best bosses of all time. Unfortunately, it's also maybe got some of the worst. So after playing through the entire game and beating every single boss, I decided that I would go through and rank all of the bosses from F tier to S tier. So what am I ranking these bosses on? Truthfully, it's just how much I liked each boss, but that can be broken down by a few things. How difficult is the boss while being fair as well? I'm also keeping things in mind such as the run back to the boss as well as the arena the boss fights in. And if the boss has some ridiculous gimmick to it, that can either give it points or take away points from it based on if I like the gimmick or not. Because let's be honest, some gimmicks are really good and some gimmicks are really bad. So with all of that criteria laid out, I'm Scotty and this is ranking every single boss in Dark Souls 1. By the way, I played the remastered edition on Steam. Starting in F tier, these are bosses that I think are pretty bad and I wish I could just skip them when I play through the game. Starting at number 26, the Bed of Chaos. If you've played the Bed of Chaos, you know what makes this fight so bad. My first time playing through Dark Souls, I heard everyone talk about how terrible the Bed of Chaos was, so I was ready for something terrible. I thought it was some ridiculous boss that was way too difficult or had way too much health, so I was very surprised when I found a boss that died in three hits. This is the boss everyone's been complaining about? But on repeat playthroughs, you can see why this boss is so bad. And honestly, on the first one, my expectations were just set differently than what it was. This boss is kind of like a platformer. There's something on the left you have to hit, something on the right you have to hit, and then you have to go down the middle to finally kill the boss. However, while this is happening, not only is the floor falling out from under you, but the boss is using ridiculous attacks that are either killing you or pushing you into these holes in the ground. In fact, FromSoft knew this boss was so bad, they gave it checkpoints. Checkpoints in a Dark Souls game. I'm not kidding. And, and don't get me started about when you're on the final phase and the fire comes up through the ground and just one shots you. Come on, man. Who made this boss? This one belongs in F tier. At number 25, we have Demon Fire Sage. Now, the Demon Fire Sage is actually kind of fun to fight if he wasn't the third use of the Asylum Demon in this game, the first boss you fight. Now, the Asylum Demon himself isn't a bad boss fight, and the Fire Sage Demon has a few new attacks to spice things up. But when this is your third time encountering this boss, which it was for me, it's just like, could I have gotten something else, please? It's like if for breakfast you had a uh, uh, bread, like some good bread, and then for lunch you had bread again, and then for dinner you had bread again. By dinner, you're not wanting bread anymore. I just would have honestly rather had this boss not exist than exist at all. And that's why he's sitting here at number 25. At number 24, we have Pinwheel. Pinwheel is the keeper of the catacombs, found right after the annoying ass wheel skeletons. And if you fight him at the start of the game, he's actually a little bit hard. But if you fight him on the way to Nito, uh, he gets one shot. In my playthrough, I decided to fight him early because it's something I've never done before. And he actually was the slightest bit of a challenge. I think I died to him once. But usually you just like three shots. Whoa! And I know my friend Tim's gonna be mad at me for this placement because he loves this boss as it has really cool lore implications. But if you're not looking through the lore and you're just running past this guy, he's kind of just cannon fodder. Unfortunately, Pinwheel's sitting here at number 24. That's rounding out the F tier. Next, we're moving on to the D tier. These bosses aren't great, but I'm fine with them being in the game, but I'd rather not fight them. At number 23, we have Ceaseless Discharge. Ceaseless Discharge is found right after Chaos Witch Quaylog, and he has very sad lore implications. Trying to guard his dead sister, and when you pick up her clothes, he decides that it's time to square up. He's not just gonna let you steal his dead sister's clothes, like that would be ridiculous. So what does he do? He blows fires at you and swings his giant hand, which if you're trying to fight him right after doing Quaylog, these moves are both going to one-shot you. He has a ridiculous health pool, and if you're trying to just hit his hand when it falls, you're not gonna have a very good time. However, Dark Souls intentionally made a quote unquote cheese way to beat this boss. If you just run back to the start, he'll jump after you, falling into an abyss below him. A lot of people call this the cheese way to kill him, but it's very obvious that they intended this as the way to kill him. I mean, why else would they make it so you can kill him like this? They would not have made it a giant arena where you can lead him over an abyss that he will jump to and fall into if this was not the intended way to kill this guy. If you're mad at me for killing this guy this way, then you're just a masochist. Why would you kill him any other way? 
However, that means this fight isn't very fun. You just run to the start, sometimes dying on the way there. You can't fight him the real way. It's just not a good fight. I'm sorry. It's cool that it's in the game though, and lore-wise, I actually like that it's here. But for that, it only sits at number 23. At number 22, we have Dark Sun Gwendolyn. Dark Sun Gwendolyn is a very cool fight. When you first turn on Orlando into Twilight Mode and discover this boss battle with Gwyn's lost son, you're in for a treat. It's really cool. The infinite hallway spanning forever is very interesting. However, this fight is kind of boring. You run down a long hall chasing Dark Sun Gwendolyn until you finally get to him and get to get about maybe two to three hits in before he teleports farther back. As he's doing this, he's launching three different attacks at you. He has two different magic attacks and one kind of arrow archer-like attack. At first, these attacks will one-shot you and kill you, but once you figure out the patterns in the tells, there's really no reason to get hit by any of these attacks, making this fight walk down, hit him two times, walk down, hit him two times, over and over again until he finally dies. The reveal of this fight is amazing. The solution to this fight isn't very fun. Cool that it's in the game, not something I'm gonna wanna do again. Next at number 21, we have the Capra Demon. The Capra Demon is a bitch of a fight, especially if you're new and you don't know what's going on. On the way down to the Capra Demon, you have to make it past a bunch of thieves that are trying to backstab you and dogs that are eating you alive at every moment. And if you can finally get past all of these enemies and into his boss arena, you're met with the Capra Demon, as well as his two pit bulls ready to eat your toddler. Literally the second you walk through this door, you are getting attacked by either the Capra Demon or his two dogs or probably all three at once. This is like the guy that tells you his dog is friendly when you're really not getting friendly vibes from either of his dogs. Once you know the solution to this fight, it's not too hard to roll to the left, run up these stairs, perch yourself up here, kill both of the dogs, and then the Capra Demon himself is kind of just a pushover. However, if you don't know the solution to this fight, it's pretty much walk through the door and die, walk through the door and die, and the crowded arena doesn't make it any more fun. Really interesting as an idea for a fight and very unique for the entire Soul series, but that doesn't mean I'm trying to fight it. There's a really good video on why this fight is better than you think. I'll flash it on the screen right now, so you can go check that out if you want to. Unfortunately, I think the arguments presented in that video are represented with more knowledge than someone who's going to be playing through Dark Souls for the first time. And if you're playing through it for the first time, be ready to be stuck on this fight for a while. Capra Demon is sitting happily in D tier. At number 20, we have the Centipede Demon. The Centipede Demon is found in the depths of Lost Isolith and is almost a cool fight. If it wasn't for the fact that there is lava all over the arena. If you chop off the demon's tail, which is also made of a centipede, this whole thing is made of centipedes, then you can get a ring that allows you to walk over the lava. If not, you're stuck on this tiny little island fighting this guy that gives you almost no opportunities to attack him. Not only that, there are a few appendages you can sever off this boss, but upon doing it, they become more enemies that you have to fight. They become alive centipedes walking around that you have to deal with, and I'm not trying to deal with that. This fight looks like it'd be cool in theory, but in practice it's just frustrating to play against. And although the idea of a demon made entirely of centipedes is cool, he's also just gross, man. And rounding out the D tier at number 19, we have Crossbreed Priscilla. Crossbreed Priscilla is one of the coolest bosses in the game, in my opinion. When you walk in her boss arena, you don't even have to fight her. She gives you the opportunity to just leave. Because of this, I think she's actually awesome, and if it was up to me, I just would never fight her ever. Unfortunately for this run, that wasn't an option for us, which meant she had to die. And when you're fighting her, it's a bit of a pushover of a fight. I call things a pushover a lot. I should maybe use a different word. She's kind of a bitch. She goes invisible and you have to track her footsteps in the sand. If you can find her, she goes down in just a few hits. I did this entire run with a Black Knight Greatsword after parrying a Black Knight and killing him pretty early. Don't get me wrong, I know this weapon's broken, but there's like 10 to 20 broken strength weapons in the game, so if you want to complain about that, you can fight me. It's my playthrough. Priscilla is an amazing addition to the game and is honestly really cool that you can just walk right past her, but if you're going to fight her, it's just not going to be very fun, and that's why she sits at number 19. D tier is done. Woo! We're out of the bad bosses. Now we're at the ones that are just okay. Welcome to the C tier, baby. And to start it off at number 18, we've got the Moonlight Butterfly. The Moonlight Butterfly is really pretty. <laughs> Notice how I like, I'm struggling to find good things to say about it. It is a very pretty boss fight and it's really cool in concept. You walk into this arena and there's a beautiful butterfly flying around. 
and she'll perch every once in a while for you to hit her. Unfortunately, that means that you can only do this fight as quickly as she lets you. She'll land for a bit where you can get a few hits in before she goes back to the skies to keep launching magic at you. The magic's very easy to dodge, but if you mess up, it can definitely kill you quickly. This fight is very beautiful and a really cool idea, but can just be frustrating in practice sitting there waiting for her to land, especially when she's only got one health. At number 17, we have the Stray Demon. So the Stray Demon and the Fire Sage Demon are the exact same fight. So why is the Stray Demon up here and the Fire Sage Demon is all the way down in F tier? Upon revisiting the Undead Asylum and walking through the Asylum Demon's boss arena, I don't know why I said it like that, you will fall through the ground and encounter the Stray Demon, who you actually walk directly past at the start of the game, which is so fucking awesome. He's like the Asylum Demon, but he's down here now and he has a few new moves. Very cool, and it's cool that upon revisiting the arena, you get to rematch the Asylum Demon, but at his full strength. However, his full strength is still a pushover and a piece of shit. Like, it's the Asylum Demon with like two new moves, and they're not hard to dodge. So, although I think this fight is cool for existing, I wouldn't call it one of the better fights in the game. And that's why it's sitting here at number 17. In one spot above the Stray Demon, at number 16, we have Gravelord Nito. Before I went into this playthrough, I actually thought I was really going to enjoy Gravelord Nito. When I fight him in the speedrun, I kind of do a cheese method where I equip all my stone armor so I take no poise damage, and you can just sit in his face and hit him over and over and over again, trivializing this fight. Now in this run, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to fight him for real. I forgot how much it sucks to fight him for real. While you fight Nito, there are these three skeletons that are going after you, as well as two big ones in the back that you can not aggro, but that really cramps up the arena. Not only that, Nito spawns next to the big skeletons, so if you want to not aggro them, you have to wait for him to walk over to you, and he might not even walk over to you. Instead, he might let out this piercing wail where he stabs his dagger into the ground, and you can't see him because he's over there and not over here, and his fucking dagger randomly pops out of the ground and if you get hit by it you get toxic you instantly get toxic and you don't have any anti-toxin because you wasted it earlier on other guys that also do toxic because why is there toxic why is toxic and poison different status effects that are cured by different things what the fuck on top of that dealing with the three skeletons plus the two you have to ignore in the back and not being able to hit Nito on his back. Did you know that? You can't hit Nito on his cape of guys. You have to hit him in the front. Made this fight really annoying. And the run back's not very fun either through the Tome of Tomb of Giants. Like, like, look at this compilation of me dying in the Tomb of Giants. There should be another, like, hole to drop down somewhere over here. No. Nope. My controller just instantly disconnected or something. And get, kill get killed by Pinwheel. I know what you might say, you might say get good, but it's like, I'm the one who, I, I beat it. So clearly I have gotten good. Like just because, you can't say get good. I mean, you can, but you're a dick. Like if you say, if, if you, I'm having a panic attack live on mic right now. Gravelord Nito's is number 16. And at number 15, we have the gaping dragon. The gaping dragon can be found in the depths. And if you use the master key, there's a good chance you skipped this boss which is kind of a shame. The Gaping Dragon design-wise is really cool. Having this kind of like crocodile mouth that is his stomach that also kind of looks like something else that I'm not gonna say. I'm not gonna say. It looks like it looks like a fucking vagina, guys. Sorry, but it does. The Gaping Dragon is a cool idea of a fight with very simple attacks that are well telegraphed. But the thing that makes this fight hard is his ridiculous hitboxes. Sometimes he'll start just running and you're not ready for his entire body to become a hitbox, but it does. My first time through this game, I really struggled on this boss. But on this playthrough, it was honestly fine. I think I may have died to it once. But with some janky hitboxes and a huge health bar for the point of game you're at, he's just not the best fight in the world. You can chop off his tail though, which is honestly really cool. There are a lot of bosses in this game where you can chop off their tails and use it as a weapon. Please don't do this with real animals. And for the last boss sitting in C tier, we have the Taurus Demon. The Taurus Demon ambushes you on your way to the Bell Gargoyles on this thin bridge. 
And it's a pretty cool fight. You can actually push him off the bridge as well as just fight him straight up and it's really easy. There's also a gold pine resin given to you right before this fight that trivializes it. Some people will say this makes the fight too easy, but like FromSoft obviously put this gold pine resin right before the fight for a reason. The other thing you can do is climb up the ladder and plunging attack him over and over again. I've never tried to do this, so I decided to try it in this run, where he then jumped up after me and started beating the shit out of me. I didn't even know he would do that. It's a decent fight, but just a little uninteresting and boring. But for the part of the game that it hits you at, it's a great fight. But in the overall grand scheme of the game, it's just okay. And now we enter the B tier. And I know already some people are thinking like, uh, you know, there are some bosses that he hasn't said yet that are definitely like worse than the bosses he's already talked about, which means he's gonna talk about them up here. If you believe that, I'm sorry. We, we disagree in opinions and you can go in the comments and tell me what you think I did wrong and I'm gonna reply to you and I'm gonna say, you're wrong and I'm right. However, if you try and fight me with facts and logic, I will respond to you with a monkey paw of sorts. At number 13, we have the Asylum Demon. Finally, the original version of the Asylum Demon. Way higher than both of his brothers. Are they triplets or are they just brothers? Do you guys think they have to fight over who's allowed to play on the Xbox? The Asylum Demon is the first boss you fight in the game, and when you first encounter him on your first playthrough, this guy's terrifying. He's actually ported over from an enemy in Demon Souls, but I guess I don't know why I mentioned that. It's not important. He's a great end of the tutorial boss, and by allowing you to start the fight with a plunging attack, it removes about half of his health bar, allowing the player to feel like they have a lot of agency in this fight, even though it's just the very start of the game. The Asylum Demon is a great tutorial boss who has a really awesome vibe in the middle of the Undead Asylum. Shout out the Asylum Demon. I like him way more than both of his brothers. At number 12, we have the Iron Golem. Standing at 20 feet tall at the top of Sen's Fortress, he's probably taller than 20 feet. I don't know why I even described him like that. The Iron Golem feels like the ultimate defender of Sen's crazy, wacky, wild world. After running through all of these traps, you get to the top and you find this giant golem. And as you fight him, if you didn't go and do something about the giant up here, you're gonna get bombarded by bombs. However, the Iron Golem has a really neat gimmick to him. If you hit his legs, he'll start to wobble, which you can then continue to hit his legs to make him fall. If you can angle this right, you can just knock him off the map, ending the fight instantly. It's not a super easy thing to do, but with a bit of practice, you can do it pretty consistently. I think a gimmick like this is really cool. And the boss himself has just a really strong and impeding aura. In general, I think he's a great boss for the point you find him in the game. And I'm never upset to fight him. It's always a fun and interesting battle to me. And that's why he's sitting here at number 12. And right above him at number 11 is Seath the Scaleless. I understand why some people might not like this fight. But I think the whole cinema of this fight is amazing. Upon encountering Seath the first time, he kills you. And you can do nothing about it. Because he is immortal and perched up there, you have to just take the death and cry. Upon respawning in his lair, you break out of his jail cell, you do a few puzzles before you get the rematch finally after walking past the invisible pathways. I skipped all of this by doing Seath skip. <laughs> I just didn't do any of that. I just did the skip. If you don't know the skip, you can do a few rolls with a bow at this part of the map on the elevator to just skip past all of this extra stuff and not have to die. If you're upset about that, hey, you can go fight him yourself. I didn't. I mean, I fought him at the end. The end fight is cool too. After breaking his crystal, he finally gains mortality and loses his immortality, where you can finally fight him and bring him down to your size. And in this fight, he's actually pretty easy. The only thing to look out for is this crystal attack, which can curse you. If you get cursed in this game, you get dropped to half health without a very easy way to fix it. The nice thing though, is you can fight the ghost in New Londo if you do this. So I guess if you're cursed, go ahead over there. Besides that, this fight is pretty easy. I don't think you can chop off one of Seat's tails. If you can, um, let me know. That sounds pretty cool. I've never done it before though. I feel like you must be able to. Maybe I'm just lying. Overall, this fight isn't that bullshit and it's pretty fun. I enjoy doing it and I think cinematically it's one of the cooler fights in the game, which is why it's sitting in B tier. And at number 10, we have the Four Kings. After unflooding New Londo upon talking to Ingrid, or killing him like I did, sorry Ingrid, you get to walk through the bottom parts of New Londo, finding all of these creepy monsters before finally going through this fog wall, jumping down the abyss, and dying. If you don't have the ring equipped, you will just die when you jump down here. However, upon getting the ring, you land in a deep dark abyss where the first of four kings spawn. There's actually more than four kings. You know like five or six can spawn if you don't kill them fast enough? This fight is a DPS check. 
the health bar on the bottom is not the same as the health bar of each individual king. And although the individual kings have an awesome vibe to them, rocking this crazy face. Look at this guy's face. If you haven't looked at it, you gotta take a look. This shit's crazy. And upon taking him out, you have to wait for the next king to spawn. If you killed him fast enough, if you don't do enough damage, the next king will spawn. You have to fight two at once and maybe even three at once. My first time through this game, I was using the life hunt scythe, which just did not do enough damage to break through these guys. So this fight was incredibly hard for me. But if you do have enough damage, this fight becomes kind of a pushover. However, the feeling of fighting guys in the middle of the abyss, not having good depth perception because there's nothing to compare them to, and not knowing when the next one is going to spawn is such an awesome and terrifying feeling. I've heard some people think this is the hardest fight in the game, but once you learn what weapons are good against him, I think he's honestly incredibly easy. The thing that plagues this fight the most is bad hitboxes in this projectile attack that chases you infinitely. Besides blocking it, I'm not sure what you're supposed to do about it. You can tell me in the comments what you're supposed to do about it, but I mean, it doesn't matter. So that's why the Four Kings is at number 10. And at number 9, we have the official final boss of the game, Gwyn, Lord of Cinders. Upon walking into Gwyn's lair and feeling the music hit your ears, you immediately are met with a cinematic and awesome fight. Gwyn is fast with incredibly difficult moves to dodge, and he gives you very little time to heal or even breathe at all. This fight could potentially be one of the better fights in the game, if it wasn't for one secret little trick. This fight is the only fight in this game, I believe, that is parryable. Yeah, you heard me, Gwyn the Lord of Cinders, the last guy in the game, you can parry him. And if you know the timing on this, it trivializes the fight. He only has one move that's hard to parry, and it's this really fast move. Besides that, every other move is very easy to parry. And if you just press L2 a few times and stab him in the chest, you'll be done with this fight in no time. Gwyn is a very cool fight that's plagued by the fact that this game wanted to represent him as decaying and not ready to hold the throne anymore. He's supposed to feel like this, which is part of the reason this fight is so cool. However, from a boss standpoint, it's a bit of a pushover once you can hit this parry. Luckily, we did get a version of him in Dark Souls 3 where we actually get to fight him without being able to parry. Shout out Soul of Cinders. You'll see how I feel about that boss when we get to Dark Souls 3. And that gets us done with the B tier where we're moving up to the A tier. These are the bosses in the game that are good. And I mean good. Like when I'm talking to another person about Dark Souls 1, we're probably talking about one of these bosses going, oh yeah, that's a good boss. And starting at number eight, we have Black Dragon Calamine. I feel like most people might put this fight higher than I do, but I think this fight is plagued by a few weird things. Calamite has some strange hitboxes, a bad fire hitbox, and a huge health bar. On top of this, I think he's plagued by one of the worst runbacks in the game, having to go through three dogs in order to get to him. Three whole dogs! I hate the dogs, man. You heard me complain about the dogs with the Capra demon, and these ones are, they're just like the other ones, but they're here now in front of Calamite. I will say, the cinema of this fight, of talking to Hawkeye Gao and having him shoot down Calamite, was super awesome. This blind giant who is past his time, picking up his bow for one last shot, oh my god, that shit was so cool. It gave me crazy goosebumps. But Calamite being plagued by bad hitboxes and some annoying attacks, like this one that breathes fire on the ground that means you just have to stop fighting him for like a whole five seconds. I really wish there was a world where I could put him higher because I do think it's a cool fight. But after I got hit by this eye move, like come on, how did I get hit by that? I was all the way over there. That's why he's only at number eight. Very good fight though. At number seven, we have the Great Wolf Sith. Great Grey Wolf? Why has it gotta be about color? Grey Wolf Sif is one of the most emotional fights in the entire Dark Souls series, especially if you've encountered Sif in the DLC before this, where you'll get a special cutscene. Sif is both defending the grave of his master Artorius, while also testing you to see if you can truly beat the one to rekindle the flame and defeat the darkness. Sif is a great fight. Seeing this oversized dog pick up a giant sword in its mouth and get ready to fight you is amazing. However, Sif's moves become pretty easy to dodge. The only way Sif gives you a hard time is if he's deciding to jump around the room over and over again. Sometimes you can get a Sif that's really hoppy who just hops back and forth. In this run, I didn't. If you can just get under Sif's belly, the fight becomes very trivial. Upon knocking Sif to low health, he starts throwing out moves that are slower and sadder than ever before. It's really sad that we have to kill Sif every playthrough, 
Rest in peace to the goodest boy there ever was. And rest in peace to his master, Artorius, as well. You are a good dog, Sif. At number six, we have the Sanctuary Guardian. Upon pulling up to the DLC after a complicated amount of events that you have to do, the Sanctuary Guardian awaits you immediately, guarding all of Ulusil. The Sanctuary Guardian kind of feels like a beefed up version of Sif to me. It was a really difficult fight, moving way faster and hitting way harder than I expected it to. Luckily, the run back is incredibly short, the bonfire being about 10 seconds away, allowing you to try this boss over and over again. That made it feel a lot more sustainable, honestly. What made the Sanctuary Guardian so hard for me is the small windows of opportunity it gives you to hit it. If you don't punish the Sanctuary Guardian for the right moves, you're either getting hit or the Guardian is going to jump away, not allowing you to attack it. However, after fighting him enough and seeing all of his different moves, you eventually get the feel for it. Something about Dark Souls is that a lot of these bosses that you fight are incredibly simple and don't have a big variety of moves. If you look down at the bosses talked about earlier in this list, bosses like Asylum Demon, Capra Demon, even the Centipede Demon, Man, so many bosses have demon in them. Iron Golem only have a few moves that you need to learn and dodge. The bosses in this game kind of feel like just giant enemies instead of long thought out bosses. The Sanctuary Guardian and the whole DLC feels incredibly different. The Dark Souls 1 DLC consists of a lot of themes that modern FromSoft has chosen to continue using in their bosses. And because of that, it's gonna pull them above a lot of the other ones. And you can see that immediately with the first boss of the DLC in Sanctuary Guardian. A fun fight that surprised me with how difficult it was and how fast paced it was. I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but I've never even touched the DLC of this game. And if you want to see my first time playing through it, you can go check it out in the video I published just earlier this week, where I fought every single boss in the game. However, there are a few bosses in the game that sit ahead of Sanctuary Guardian. And that leads us to number five, Chaos Witch Quaylog. Upon entering Quaylog's arena after running through all of Blight Town, you're encountered by this spider and sitting on top of it, this big, beautiful woman with long, beautiful hair and big, beautiful eyes who is ready to defend her throne. Chaos Witch Quaylog has a giant arena that is made smaller by the fact that the spider is constantly spawning lava, creating a new custom arena as you fight it. She has a few moves that are incredibly well telegraphed. And every move that comes out of the spider is telegraphed well by even Quaylog herself, doing things like bending down to pet the spider right before it explodes in a fiery explosion that kills you. And the nice thing about this boss, there's a bonfire right at the bottom of Blight Town. It's very easy to get to this boss. You might be poisoned, but it's really not that big of a deal. You brought your purple moss clumps, right? Overall, this boss is a great challenge for the point you hit her at. It is honestly just super awesome cinematically and a very cool fight. You have to remember that your first time through this game, this is one of the first bosses you're encountering and she is not a pushover. However, these days, I really don't struggle with Quaylog anymore. Doesn't make her any worse of a fight. That giant fire sword is so fucking awesome. And at the top of A tier, we have the gatekeepers of Dark Souls 1, the Bell Gargoyles. The Bell Gargoyles are your first real challenge in this game. Standing at the top of the Undead Berg and right before the first bell you have to ring in order to progress the game, you have a bell gargoyle climbing down from his tower, ready to fight. His moveset is simple. He's got about three different moves, being able to breathe fire and swing his axe in a few different ways. However, you can chop off his tail to get some extra damage before you fight him, as well as still having a gold pine resin that we picked up earlier before the Taurus Demon, making this fight a lot easier. If you've got a decent weapon and some gold pine resin, you can stagger him with ease, allowing you to combo him in a corner until he gets to half health in a second bell gargoyle spawn. Now this sounds like it might be bullshit and too hard for a new player, which, Honestly, it kind of is, but luckily they spawned the second bell gargoyle with only half health, making it easier to deal with. Overall, this is an amazing fight that really tests your patience and how to deal with multiple enemies at once, with one gargoyle usually approaching you and being aggressive and the other one kind of sitting in the back and spraying fire. Once you know the secret to taking out these two guys though, you can get it done pretty quickly and easily. An amazing fight that gatekeeps the rest of Dark Souls and if you can't beat him, Sorry, bro. Game's not for you. Dark Souls is for everyone, but you also have to be, you got, you got to beat the guys. You got to beat the guys, guys. And that ends out our A tier, which brings us to three more bosses and the top of S tier. These bosses are the pinnacle of boss design in this game. And it makes me happy that I can include one that's not even in the DLC. That probably sits maybe in my top 10 bosses in Souls history. And that is number three, Ornstein and Smo. Ornstein and Smo is probably the best duo boss fight in all of Souls. Smo is a big, sluggish, slow, 
monster. He's an executioner wearing a mask so you can never see his true face. Never being allowed into Gwyn's army due to his cannibalistic nature, Smo stands tall, and if you get hit by his giant hammer, you could die in just one hit. Luckily, he's slow. Unfortunately, his partner here, Ornstein, is not. He will dash at you from across the arena, and it'll be glitchy, but that's not important. I can't believe they didn't fix this glitch in the remaster. Come on, FromSoft. Ornstein is fast with lightning projectile attacks that will have you on the tip of your toes. Upon killing one of them, the other one will absorb the other's life force, increasing it and turning it into Super Ornstein or Super Smo. If it's Ornstein, he does it with respect. If it's Smo, he does it with anger. <laughs> the super fight after defeating one is honestly just so fun. And although I usually defeat Ornstein first, I think I have fought Super Ornstein once or twice. Super Smo is a great fight. Ornstein and Smo are a great fight that really tests your patience and really helps you learn how to deal with two guys at once and their move sets complement each other so well. They both have incredibly simplistic move sets with only a few attacks and yet they're still so menacing and scary. It stinks that these guys are probably the peak of Dark Souls 1 before the DLC, as everything that comes after them just isn't as good. I'm glad to say though that after walking through a Norlando and finally encountering Ornstein and Smo, it is the boss fight that it deserves to be. Being both difficult, cinematic, and fun to play. I will never forget the first time I was able to kill one of them, and the other one went up to full health and became giant and super. That shit really scared me. But upon defeating it for the first time, I popped off like no other. This fight is plagued by a shitty run back, but a lot of it can be skipped by just jumping over this little railing right here. So just do that. Ornstein and Smo are one of the best fights in the game, and I'm very happy for their inclusion, and that's why they sit at the bottom of S tier at number 3. And one spot above Ornstein and Smo at number 2, and some of you are going to be mad about the one it is. It's Artorius. Artorius is one of the coolest fights in the game, because the entire game of Dark Souls, you're being told about this legendary warrior who defeated the Abyss, who stopped everyone from crumbling, until you go back in time to the DLC, and you find him for himself and he is not what you were told he was. Artorius has been consumed by the Abyss and is now ready to fight and defeat you. Artorius is fast, and he has a moveset that honestly mimics and rivals yours as the player. Artorius is a fight that you will see in Dark Souls 3 very commonly with an advanced moveset and animations that are really, really cool. The way he stands with his limp arms, not really able to function, and the way he moves is so creepy. This fight feels like a great back and forth between you and the legendary warrior you've heard about the entire game. You have to find your chances to attack, which Artorius gives you many chances to hit him. Having long, punishing moves where you can get one or two hits in, and I think he's even staggerable if I remember correctly. He powers up a few times in the fight, increasing his damage and not really changing his moveset. This fight took me a while, but every single time I fought him, it never felt bullshit or unfair. It just felt like I needed to get better. And that's why he sits here at number two. Upon defeating the legendary Knight Artorius, you know that he no longer is here to defeat the Abyss. And now it's up to you to defeat the final boss of this ranking and number one of my list, Manus, Father of the Abyss. Manus is fast and strong. Upon entering this fight the first few times, I immediately got one shot, not even knowing what to do. After going down and down and down through the abyss, getting deeper and deeper, Manus grabs you and pulls you into his fight, and you get ready for the best fight in the game. The fight against Manus doesn't feel like a cat and mouse where it's my turn to hit and your turn. It's always Manus's turn to hit, and you need to find your hits in between his attacks. However, upon looking for it, you can find plenty of chances to hit Manus. Some of these moves are very laggy, giving you plenty of chances to heal, and you would think it would give you a chance to hit him several times. Until you hit him, knocking him out of the end lag of his attack and getting ready to hit you again. Halfway through this fight, he'll stop just using physical attacks and start using his dark magic to fight you. Manus is the darkness of humanity, incarnated into a large beast, ready to take over the world. And if it wasn't for you, he would succeed. Manus does incredibly high damage, he has incredibly fast attacks, and he has moves that if you are caught lacking, will one-shot you. This was the fight that took me the longest in the game, clocking in at probably about three to four hours of a non-stop brutal grind. But upon finally finishing him with the Johnny Cash Hurt power-up, I had a feeling like no other. I hurt myself today.
This is one of my favorite fights, and maybe even my favorite fight I've ever done in a Souls game. Having such a fast-paced boss in the semi-clunky and high-damage engine of Dark Souls 1 was super exciting. Because truthfully, it only takes 12 to 15 hits to kill this boss, unlike some of the big, healthier bosses in Dark Souls 3. But Manus is not going to let you get those hits in easily. He will punish you every step of the way and force you to play perfectly in an attempt to beat this boss. And that is why he stands tall at the number one of my boss ranking. Thank you so much for watching my boss ranking of Dark Souls 1. I really appreciate it. Make sure you go check out the full run over on my YouTube channel. It's one video before this, and it's a really fun and amazing video. If you're watching this, I've already started and maybe even finished fighting every single boss in Dark Souls 2. Make sure to go check out my Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash skytrip, but the I is a 1. I'll be going through and fighting every single boss in every FromSoft game, streaming it live for everyone to see, as well as ranking every boss in each individual game, and at the end, I'll rank all of them together. This is a long, grueling project, so make sure you drop a sub if you want to see me get through it all. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and share this to a friend who likes Dark Souls 1 or that you want to convince to play it. I also have this exact video style for Hollow Knight with a long playthrough of the game as well as a boss ranking, so go check that out if you want to. Once again, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.